Hi, if everyone could uh, take their seats, please, so we can get started. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to session 11, the last session of the main meeting. Um, I'm Luke Schulson. I'm chairing the session. Our first talk is going to be uh, Laura Busa, who's going to be talking about neuronal circuit dynamics in the visual thalamocortical system. Great. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the organizers for me having me here. I'm very, very honored to be on the stage and to be able to show some of our research to you. And thanks for integrating me also in the cosine community. So the title of my talk will be about neuronal circuit dynamics in the visual thalamocortical system. But before I'm going to dive deep into the data, I want to um, tell you that the overarching research goal of my group is to understand how stimulus and behavioral context influence the activity in neural circuits of the visual system. And for that, we focus on the retinal cortical pathway. This is the pathway that extends from the retinal ganglion cells at the back of the eye that project through their uh, axon, through the optic tract, to the first order thalamic relay in the visual system, the dorsolateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and from there, so-called relay cells send their axons to primary visual cortex. This is, of course, a very classic pathway, but we think it's important to focus on that pathway because it is the pathway that we think is underlying image-forming vision, so it's the start, maybe, of things like object recognition and visual perception. In the past, we have uh, contributed to understanding this pathway in various aspects. So we studied how retinal inputs are integrated in LGN, how the output of LGN influences V1 dynamics and feature selectivity. We are also very interested in how feedback from primary visual cortex then uh, projects back to LGN and maybe conveys things like spatial context, and we study how arousal signals from the brainstem modulate neural processing in LGN. Today, I want to show you um, one study that is conducted by a senior graduate student in my lab. Uh, his name is Davide Crombie, and he's so senior that he actually had his last day on Friday. He's packing his things and moving to here because he's starting a postdoc with Zach Meinen. So what I'm going to show you is how internal state modulates neural dynamics in the visual thalamus. So what do I mean by internal state? So internal state is reflected in ever-varying brain activity. It, is, uh, it influences how we respond to stimuli, how we make decisions, and how we select actions. It is thought to involve in this hidden multidimensional space where we don't even really understand what the axes are that span this space. Um, but it is associated mechanistically with both neuromodulatory influences and the dynamics of excitation and inhibition, as was pointed out very nicely also yesterday. In visual cortex, it's known that active internal states are reflected in a depolarized membrane potential. So you can see here a cartoon of a cortex neuron, and when the animal is in an active state, you can see that this uh, membrane potential becomes elevated and desynchronized. Um, and at the same time, there's a reduction in these low-frequency rhythms that are typically associated with drowsy or uh, non-alert uh, behavioral states. What is interesting is, for those who cannot do in vivo uh, intracellular recordings, that uh, these internal states map onto overt behaviors such as locomotion and pupil size or the changes of pupil size. And this is also illustrated here where you can see that the uh, alert behavioral states are associated with increases in pupil diameters or big pupil dia dia dynamics versus the um, drowsy states are associated with uh, decreasing pupil diameters or small pupil sizes. So this 
Locomotion and pupil indexed internal state modulations have been very well characterized along the entire road and early visual system. So here you can see the data for this V1 membrane potential enhancement during active states versus quiescence. Um, you can see that membrane potential is typically depolarized during active states. This is also true for the somatosensory primary somatosensory cortex. In the middle here, you have modulations of DLGN spiking activity with locomotion. So the activity of neurons is generally enhanced when the animal is running compared to stationary. And the ratio of spikes fired in bursts is um, dramatically reduced when the animal is running. Um, this is um, our own previous work. And then here on the right side, you see very beautiful work from the Andaman lab that is also now being carried out, similar work in other labs, where um, not only the LGN activity itself, but also the inputs to LGN are modulated by behavioral state. So you can see here as a function of normalized pupil area, the fluorescence in retinal boutons that come into LGN and you see that when the animal is in a low arousal state, um, so a small pupil, you have lots of flu more fluorescence at the retinal boutons compared to when the animal is in a high arousal state and the pupil is large. So these studies and many more that are um, not cited here have delivered very important insights into state modulations at a synaptic, cellular, and circuit level. But if you think about these studies and the introduction I just gave the slide before, um, it is uh, very obvious that these studies, including our own work here, um, used the prevailing approach of dividing this data into mutually exclusive peer, um, periods of time. And if you think about what I said about state modulations in the slide before, and if you think about the fact that pupil size is a readout for a really wide, wide range of nested processes that are related to internal state, and some of them are listed here, one could maybe agree that uh, this procedure of dividing time into mutually exclusive periods in the data likely fails to capture this full granularity of the behavior and the associated neural activity. So one guiding principle that we applied in our work is uh, to consider time scales of processes because that is not only uh, maybe one principle according to which one can uh, order these behavioral processes that are underlying signals that all feed into the pupil signal, but also mechanistically it has already been shown that neuromodulatory systems also have different time scales. So this is recordings from Reimer et al. that uh, recorded um, neuromodulatory axons over V1. And you can see that uh, neuromodulatory axons that uh, release norepinephrine will track uh, phasic pupil changes um, much better or will be coupled to the pupil at more higher frequencies compared to cholinergic axons over V1 that track uh, longer lasting pupil dilations and locomotion. So we believe that uh, maybe these time scales are a good guiding principle in understanding the relationship between behavior um, and pupil size and behavior and neural um, modulations. All right, so the two questions that I want to address today is uh, how can we char characterize now the pupil signals that would allow capturing this multi-time scales and the nestedness of the underlying processes? And second, how does the pupil signal at all these different multiple time scales relate to spontaneous and stimulus-driven neural activity? Our experimental approach is recordings, extra, extracellular recordings in LGN of the thalamus, and we record also the behavioral state of our animals uh, via the locomotion sensors of the head-fixed animals running on the ball, and also with an infrared eye-tracking camera. Um, we think, we, st we thought to start very simple, and just in these experiments present a constant gray screen, large gray screen um, stimulus, so we don't have any influence from a um, visual stimulus in addition to these internal state modulations. What you can see here is an example recording um, that we performed in LGN. You can see in blue the firing rates of an example neuron. In black, you have the trace of the pupil area, and in green, you have the simultaneously recorded locomotion trace. And if you look at these uh, variables, it's very clear that this neuron uh, is modulated by um, pupil size, so the firing rate is related to the overall size of the pupil. It goes up and down with it. And you can also see what has been described um, many times before, that the pupil signal is also correlated to locomotion. So when the animal is running, we have typically large uh, dilated pupils. 
uh, when we construct pupil size cur tuning curves for LGN neuron, um, this looks like here. So we have all the neurons that we recorded uh, on the y-axis, the pupil size on the x-axis, and uh, in color you have the firing rate of the neuron. And you can see that many, many neurons in LGN, in particular, in, in uh, more specifically, 90% of neurons are actually modulated uh, by the size of the pupil. Not all of them are modulated in ways that I was showing with the example neuron that's located here. So not everybody is increasing its firing rate um, with increasing pupil size. So this modulation is not always monotonically increasing, but about half of the, slightly more than half of the population of recorded neurons have their peak firing rate outside of the top 90% pupil size. I want to point out that some of this tuning that we observe here might be caused by what we consider maybe re-afferent input, so by increases in retinal illumination that goes along with this increased pupil size. But we have done many of the experiments that I'm going to show also in conditions under darkness where um, we observe very similar modulations, and that's why we think that um, this picture that you see here is largely derived from non-retinal origin. All right, so let's turn back to um, this example neuron that I've shown in the beginning. What you can see in addition to this overall modulation by pupil size is that the firing rate seems also to be linked to pupil dynamics. So you can see that, uh, uh, for example, here in these uh, periods marked with one, we have coupling of firing rate to the dilating phases of the pupil dynamics, and these uh, um, increases in firing rate can happen when the pupil is overall relatively small or when it's relatively large. So in addition to overall size, LGN firing rate seems to be sensitive to changes in pupil size. And if we even take away this uh, neural activity and just look at the pupil size signal, it seems to be uh, modulated on many different timescales, multiple timescales, and that has also already been described in the literature. So some of the modulations here are called microdilations in the literature. Okay, so the question is, how can we quantify now all these timescales in the pupil signal? What we chose to do is to decompose this pupil signal with a method called empirical mode decomposition. And this method allows us to extract this multi-scale time information about changes in internal state. So the EMD or uh, empirical mode decomposition is a very data-driven composition method that doesn't make any assumptions about the underlying signal. But what it yields is a set of locally narrowband components um, that can have asymmetric phase progression. And what I show you here is basically the pupil signal in gray. And one of the components that is extracted by the EMB this is the most high frequency component that is extracted. And you can see that this component captures some of these high frequency fluctuations in the signal. The EMD now gives us a set of components, not only this very high frequency, but also other um, components with other frequencies. And hopefully you can appreciate by comparing the original signal with these different components that we extract, that these components can capture different uh, aspects of the signal. So while this high frequency component captured the uh, very uh, high frequency fluctuations, other components in the signal capture other uh, frequencies, and these low frequency components, for example, capture the overall trends. All right, so from now on, I will refer to this set of components that we get from um, this decomposition uh, as components of pupil dynamics, or CPDs. And uh, what is very beautiful about them is that they are, like I said, locally narrowband, and they are now amenable to Hilbert spectral analysis. So we can go and maybe look at this uh, piece of the signal in more detail and can characterize basically this component of pupil dynamics by the instantaneous frequency, amplitude, and phase. So what you see here is this piece, uh, cutout piece of the pupil signal, and you can see how it progresses across different phases with different amplitude and with different frequencies. And if we take the amplitude rated uh, frequency, instantaneous frequency, we can come up with a measure that we call a characteristic time scale. It's just the amplitude rated frequency. All right, so now returning back to this full set of components, what you can see is that these components contribute to the overall signal with various uh, relative power. And you can see that these components span frequencies of about an order of uh, three orders of magnitude, so ranging from something like seconds to minutes. All right. 
Um, so overall, this pupil signal contains components that vary across uh, over three orders of magnitude and frequency. And what you can see is if we do this composition, not only for this particular experiment, but for the sessions that we recorded in total, is that uh, also here you can see many components across uh, very many different time scales. Here what we plot is the power of the components as a, a function of time scale. You can see that they span a wide array. And what is very interesting is that if you collect the time scales with the highest power per recording, you can also see that that spans quite a number of time scales. And this might indicate that maybe with uh, like a restricted bandpass filtering, one would miss out some of these even high um, power components. So just to summarize this part of the signal, so we are at the point where we can now decompose the pupil signal. Uh, we have uh, chosen one particular method, the empirical mode decomposition method, to capture this multi-scale nature of the pupil signal. Um, this pupil signal we show contains components that uh, span over about three orders of magnitude and frequency, so from seconds to minutes. And uh, also the component with highest power varies considerably across the sessions. And what I haven't shown you, um, but what, where we spent a lot of time was uh, um, demonstrating that these components of pupil dynamics are largely independent. Um, so we did lots of analysis showing this point. And where it matters, we also did lots of reanalysis of our data to take out periods where the phases were actually coupled. OK, so the next question that we wanted to ask in this project is, uh, how does the pupil signal at all these multiple timescales relate to spiking activity in the visual thalamus? And we think the thalamus is really a beautiful place to uh, ask these questions because it has these two different uh, spiking modes that have already been linked to different behavioral states and were introduced very nicely in the talk before. So what we did in order to relate the spontaneous LGN spiking to the phase of these pupil components is to separate the activity into tonic spikes and burst events. So tonic spikes are just the regular spikes, um, whereas the burst events are um, bursts of action potentials that fire with very brief inter-spike inter intervals, so less than four milliseconds, and are preceded by a prolonged period of silence, so more than 100 milliseconds. And these tonic and burst spikes are very interesting because they have known to have different input-output relationships. So when you inject current into a thalamic neuron that is re relatively depolar depolarized, you get this uh, almost linear input-output relationship with the tonic spikes. Whereas when you inject uh, the same current steps into a neuron that is very, uh, relatively hyperpolarized, you get this all-or-none response that is made up of these burst spikes. And lastly, I think these uh, thalamic bursts have already been very powerfully associated with behavioral states. And here's just one very beautiful ex um, um, example of that, where um, Nest Vogel and McCormick have shown a few years ago that the thalamic bursts, you can see them here um, marked in red, uh, coincide with these uh, low frequency oscillations in the um, membrane potential of primary visual cortex simultaneously recorded that have been associated with these drowsy behavioral states. OK, so we separate our uh, tonic spikes and burst spikes and uh, try to relate them to the phases of the um, pupil, components of pupil dynamics. Here you can see, again, an example of these uh, components that we extracted alongside with the phase of that component and the spiking activity of an example LGN neuron. In blue, you have always the tonic spikes, and in red, the burst spikes. And I hope you can appreciate from that example that the spiking does not seem to occur randomly, but seems to be coupled to the phases of this pupil signal. In particular, when we collect the phases of this uh, signal, at each time of the spike, we can construct so-called uh, phase tuning curves, where you have uh, these polar tuning curves. The deviation from a uniform distribution, so from a circle, indicates the strength of the tuning. The dots indicate uh, the preferred phase, and uh, the stars here denote the significance. Um, what we find basically here is that the um, this LGN neurons spiking activity, maybe like you would have inferred from these spike trains, is significantly coupled to the phase of this component of pupil dynamics. We uh, really tested very rigorously for this uh, significance by having a shuffling procedure that takes into account the short-term autocorrelation of the signal. 
Um, the second that, um, interesting aspect of these phase tuning curves is that the bursts and the tonic spikes seem to prefer opposite phases of this component of pupil dynamics. So the um, burst spikes seem to happen when the pupil is, or the component actually is in a decaying phase or close to the trough, like you can see here, versus the tonic spikes seem to happen when this component is in the um, dilating phase. And finally, the bursts seem to be more strongly coupled than the tonic spikes. All right, I'm going to show you now that this holds not only for this particular um, component of pupil dynamics and LGN neuron, but this extends across the population of recorded neurons. So we find that coupling in LGN general um, um, to this component of pupil dynamics occurs over a broad range of timescales. So here, what you can see is uh, the time scale of the components on the x-axis, the preferred phase of these tuning curves that I showed you before, and in um, black, and, sorry, in blue and in red, the um, individual um, component of pupil dynamics neuron pairs with significant coupling. And the fact that we have dots all over these time scales means that we find significant coupling from the order of minutes to seconds, basically, in the LGN spiking activity. You can also very beautifully see this uh, preference for these opposite phases across neurons and across time scales. And we can illustrate this even better by taking a pairwise, or like within neuron basically difference in phase preference between the burst and the tonic spikes. Here we sort them by time scale, so you can see that this um, opposite phase preference really holds for all the time scales that we measured. And this is also summarized in this polar distribution of the phase differences. What is interesting is that these individual LGN neurons can show coupling to one or to more of the component of pupil dynamics. So we find coupling to at least one of these CPDs in 97% of neurons for tonic spiking and 87% for burst events. And like I said, this can be coupled, the activity of these LGN neurons can be coupled to more than one time scale. So on average, we find a coupling to about four time scales for tonic spikes and two for bursts. And what is interesting, if you look at the coupling strength, um, so the um, deviation of these tuning curves um, as a function of the, um, um, of the CPDs, and they were sorted basically according to um, their coupling strength, you can see that um, even for coupling then to more than one CPD, this uh, strength declines gradually. So this means that we don't only have one dominant coupling frequency, but uh, also for neighboring frequencies, non-preferred frequencies, we have a substantial contribution. So this we interpret as having nested modulations within the spiking of single neurons. And finally, the last point we saw in the example neuron that bursts are more strongly coupled than tonic spikes. We see this um, across the entire population that we recorded and across all the time scales. And this might indicate that the bursts have a more privileged, basically, um, occupancy, maybe in particular behavioral states. Okay. Um, as an intermediate summary here, um, I've shown you that LGN spiking activity is coupled to pupil dynamics across a broad range of time scales that range basically from seconds to minutes. I've shown you that uh, tonic, burst, tonic spikes and bursts prefer these opposite phases of these pupil components, and individual LGN neurons can be coupled across multiple time scales, independent time scales, and this points towards uh, like a reflection of these nested processes. And finally, the bursts are more strongly coupled. So far, I've talked about how maybe we interpret this as internal state modulations, but the question is, maybe this is not really internal state, but maybe these pupil-linked LGN modulations that I've shown might be driven by overt behaviors. So the issue is that behavioral changes are associated with changes in LGN spiking. So you can see, for example, when the animal starts sitting, uh, we see a decrease in tonic spikes and maybe a slight increase in burst events. When the animal starts running, conversely, we have an increase uh, here in tonic spikes and maybe a slight decrease in burst events. And uh, also when the animal is making saccades in LGN overall, we see uh, an enhancement of activity around the time of saccades. The second issue is that uh, not only behavior is driving spiking activity, but behavior is also related to this component of pupil dynamics that we extracted. So maybe not surprisingly, given this uh, 
correlation between locomotion and pupil size that I've shown in the beginning. Um, several of the extracted CPDs are actually correlated to run speed. And maybe more interesting or maybe more non-intuitive is that also the cards seem to be coupled to these components of pupil dynamics with phase preference that look very, very similar to tonic spikes. So what you can see here is the eye position in an example session. This would be the azimuth, uh, this would be elevation. And uh, down here you see an example component of pupil dynamics. And what is very striking in this example is that uh, the saccades that happen mostly along the horizontal um, dimension, so along the azimuth, they happen whenever this, uh, or in, whenever the saccades happen, this uh, component of pupil dynamics seems to be dilating. So uh, here, 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 and here, for example. And overall, when we relate basically the occurrence of saccades to these components of pupil dynamics that we extracted in the session, we realized that the um, phase preference of these um, of the saccades basically looks very, very similar to that of tonic spiking. So to rule out that phase coupling is driven by these overt behaviors instead of by um, internal states, what we did is uh, reduce the um, throw out basically all in the, in, the, in the data analysis, all the periods um, with these different behaviors. So here we concentrate on only sitting, so no transitions between running and sitting, and we can recapitulate our main findings. Here is experiments or here's analysis where we concentrate only on running periods, no transitions between sitting and running, and we can almost recapitulate our findings. And here we excluded all the periods with saccades, and we can see the same picture basically here. Um, so all the main findings of having significant coupling across many time scales and having this opposite phase preference between burst and tonic spikes are largely preserved. Maybe one caveat is here that during running we have very little burst spikes, so maybe this pattern is not as clear as in these two cases. All right, so now, um, so far I've told you about internal state modulations, how they modulate the um, spiking activity of uh, LGN neurons in the context of a gray screen condition, so no external visual input, but is this at all relevant during conditions of stimulus viewing? And in order to test this, we basically focused on experiments that were done when the animal was viewing a naturalistic movie. The issue here is that uh, the visual stimulus, because we are in a primary sensory relay of the thalamus, of course will elicit uh, systematic tonic and burst spikes in LGN. And this might actually dominate uh, some of these internally driven activity fluctuations that I've shown before. And the second issue is that if, if we think about this dynamic naturalistic movie stimulus, that will have changes in brightness or overall luminance, and that might in turn induce pupil size changes through the pupillary light reflex. So it's a really valid question, I think, to ask if these pupil dynamics can um, uh, be coupled to spiking under these more um, viewing conditions of naturalistic stimuli. Okay, so to test this question, we presented the animals with naturalistic movies. Um, they are uh, five seconds long. You can see them here. And this is uh, movies of foliage, basically, um, and uh, contains some simulated saccades. Um, you see the example uh, responses, or responses of an example neuron here on the right. These are 200 trials of the same five-second movie. You can see every tick here is an action potential. Every uh, red tick is a burst spike. And you can see that across time, basically, this example neuron um, fires regular spikes. This would be the average um, across, uh, across trials. And what is very, very striking, I think, is that the response variability across time seems much larger, much smaller, actually, than the mean response and how it changes across time, across trial, across trial, sorry, how the mean across time changes across trials. So the variability in the signal trial to trial variability seems to be much um, higher than the average response across time. Okay, so we quantified this uh, variability basically with a response variability ratio. Uh, we saw that this neuron had a response variability ratio of 0.1, um, which means that trial to trial changes in the stimulus response, so this axis here, are much larger than the change induced by the stimulus. 
Okay, so this gives us hope that maybe despite spiking evoked by the movie stimulus, some factors unrelated to the stimulus still seem to be prevalent even under these conditions of movie viewing. So in fact, when we repeat our face tuning analysis for these naturalistic movie clips, we can again see the picture that should look very familiar by now, where we get significant coupling across many, many time scales of this um, pupil signal, and we have this opposite phase preference for burst spikes and tonic spikes. This holds actually for low frequencies, so everything below uh, 0.1 hertz, and it seems to break down for um, for frequencies that are higher than that, and maybe this is the part that gets overridden basically by this visual stimulation. Okay, so we conclude from this that for slow time scales, LGN neurons seem to have similar coupling characteristics during movies as in the absence of a patterned um, stimulus. Great, so the last question we asked was, um, does phase coupling to this component of pupil dynamics change how the movie is represented by single LGN neurons. Um, so for that, we performed a uh, support vector classification where we split this movie into five segments um, containing one second each, and we used the instantaneous spiking activity to predict which of the segments was presented. Um, and importantly for each component of pupil dynamics and neuron pair, we split the stimulus segments into two groups according to the mean phase of the component of pupil dynamics when the segment was on the screen. And we designed the bins so that uh, the phase bin one would correspond to the phase bin that would be the preferred phase for tonic spiking. All right, we then trained the decoder um, and tested it on data from the same um, CPD phase group and that saw that that actually achieved generally very high performance. So we took basically uh, within training uh, data, so trained on the same phase group, then tested later. You can see that for um, both phase group one and phase group two, so the um, groups where the, um, that contained the preferred phase of the tonic spikes and the opposite phase bin, we saw generally very high uh, decoding accuracy. This would be the chance level. And this indicated to us that uh, spiking activity during either phase um, of, the, um, of the pupil signal was informative about the movie segment. However, when we assessed, we then wanted to assess basically the differences in coding by mixing phase groups for training and testing. Um, and we did this by training on one phase group and then testing with the other one. And we assessed the decoding penalty, so the difference in decoding performance for within versus across phase groups, uh, test and training, in order to see how much the signal is actually influenced by being in one or the other of these phase groups. What we saw is that uh, we find an overall negative decoding penalty means that it hurts the decoder if we switch between uh, um, training and testing in these dis different phase groups. And importantly, this is, uh, is, uh, goes beyond basically just splitting the data and randomly assigning uh, them to two different groups. All right, so this means uh, to us that the overall, like this overall negative decoding penalty um, means to us that the movie representation really differs between the phases of pupil dynamics. All right, with this I'm at the end. Um, I've shown you that spiking activity in the visual thalamus is coupled to pupil dynamics across many te temporal scales ranging from seconds to minutes. Um, we've, saw, we've seen that bursts tended to occur during decaying phases and tonic spikes are prevalent during the rising phases of these pupil components. Coupling to pupil dynamics cannot be explained um, only um, by locomotion and eye movements. Um, coupling of spiking to these pupil dynamics persisted during stimulus viewing and influences how we encode stimuli. And in future work, we would love to relate these components to the underlying mechanisms um, to understand better why different cell types or why different neurons in LGN uh, prefer certain time scales, relate that to cell types, and test this framework during more diverse behaviors and across the brain. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, the members of my group who are um, fantastic, in particular Davide Crombie for his work on this project, and our col computational collaborator Christian Leibold for um, also co-guiding and supervising this project. I also would like to acknowledge our funding sources, our host institution, 
and thank you for your attention. I want to make one comment. We have an open postdoc position, so if you're interested in this type of work, um, come join our team, and I'm really happy to take your questions now. Thank you very much for a great talk. We have time for two or three questions. Um, yeah. Sometimes the burst uh, occurred just before the trough of the pupil dilation. Sometimes they occur during or after. I'm curious if you think that reflects some kind of directionality of what causes what uh, in the system or uh, um, what you think about the relative timing between pupil um, troughs and the bursts. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for the question. I think um, what you've seen here is just one component of the pupil dynamics and how it relates to spiking. So there are all these other nested components and maybe some of these relative shifts that were also apparent from the example derive from the fact that maybe there's another component that has its trough um, maybe slightly before or slightly after and that would also bias the, um, the, the burst spiking. Um, but overall, I think you saw that some of the tuning exists and uh, it's more like during the decaying phases and the troughs for the, for the burst spikes. And for the second part, uh, if this is causing the effects or the other way around, I think mechanistically this one, one very prominent, um, one, one very likely source, source for this could be, would be neuromodulatory systems like the acetyl choline or noradrenaline. Um, in, the, in the thalamus that would cause basically these fluctuations in excitability and then that would lead to the um, fluctuations in these burst types or burst spiking and tonic spikes. Okay, we have time for one more question um, and if the next speaker can come down please. Thanks, Laura. I wondered if you could comment on that striking phase frequency relationship yeah, yeah. in the tonic firing and what that functional yes. consequence yes. might be? Uh, thanks for the question. I think it's a very striking feature of our data. Quickly. <laughs> so, um, and you could interpret it as a signal being passed through some filter and then having different frequency responses, basically. We, um, this is a log scale, so it's not so super easy to, it's not a linear scale. Um, we try to infer a bit the time scale of this process. If it was a linear scale, it's about 300 milliseconds, which would not be absolutely off. So it could be related to maybe muscle, muscle activations or metabotropic receptors or something like that. But we don't really, um, we can't, cannot say anything more. We don't really interpret that feature, but I think it's important to realize that this antiphase relationship is not affected. So it doesn't really affect our main conclusions, I would say. Thanks for the question. Thanks again. So the next speaker is Jura Meinik from Rosa Cosart's lab, um, uh, talking about emergence of state modulation in a developing cortical circuit. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, I'm uh, Jure, and uh, today I'll talk to you about the emergence of state modulation in a developing cortical circuit. Uh, should I put it close? Ah. <laughs> Uh, today I'll talk to you about the emergence of state modulation in a developing cortical circus, circuit, which is uh, work that I did as a part of my uh, PhD in uh, Rosa Cossar lab in Marseille. But first, as an introduction, I would just want to tell you why I'm so excited about studying development, and I'll sum this up in these two pictures. So the first picture is a mouse at P0. So this is when a mouse is born. It's completely helpless. You can see that its eyes are still closed, its whiskers are not developed, and its motor skills are also severely limited. And in just a matter of a few weeks, the same mouse would look more like this. And here you see that it has these beautiful whiskers, it, its eyes are open, and it can navigate its environment um, perfectly well and survive on its own. So what I'm really interested to uh, understand in my PhD is uh, what are the changes that neural circuits undergo during this period that allowed this mouse to survive in its uh, natural habitat. But first, I would want to start <coughs> with a brief overview of uh, the differences in neural activity in development and in the adult. So one of the main characteristic differences is in synchrony. So developmental activity is um, characterized by these very synchronous events that are intertwined by periods of relative silence. Whereas in the adult, which might be more familiar to the people in the audience, um, the activity of neocortex is more asynchronous, more decorrelated, sparse. These are some words that are used to describe this activity. 
And I'm also happy that I'm going after the previous talk because I'm sure that you're all uh, convinced now that there's this um, important role of so-called state modulation in neocortical circuits where you can see here, for example, uh, signals related to running, pupil area, and whisking, and they correlate very well with the um, activity of the neurons that are recorded simultaneously in the raster above. Even though there was some work on um, how this uh, emerges during development, it is still a relative mystery. And uh, assuming that this state modulation really uh, plays an essential role in um, adult-like sensory processing, we hypothesize that it would occur at the very onset of sensation. So for example, when the eyes would open or when the whiskers would develop. <clears throat> so in order to test this hypothesis, we developed a um, novel experimental protocol that allowed us to track the activity of hundreds of neurons throughout the second and third postnatal week of development. And this is exactly the period when um, these, the sensors would uh, develop. And um, today I'll show calcium imaging recordings from uh, layer 2, 3 barrel cortex, but we also performed some experiments in the visual cortex. And uh, to have access to um, some sort of behavioral state readout, we also perform simultaneous uh, videography. So now I'll just show um, some example data that, that we gather through this uh, protocol. So I'll start on the left with some frames from a video uh, at each different age. And I would want you to focus on two main things. The first is just how much the animal is growing during this period. And the second is how the, these uh, sensory organs are really developing. So you'll see the whisker pad will become more uh, pronounced and the eyes will open at, at some later point. And on the top left, it's just the postnatal age of this mouse in days. So you see now the eyes open. And we can also simultaneously perform um, calcium imaging. And here on the right, I'm showing uh, example data from, um, from this uh, kind of recording where we're showing the activity of GCAMP uh, in green. And in red, we just have an anatomical marker for GABAergic cells, which um, also allows us to find the same field of view across uh, many days. So what we do next is uh, we perform the usual um, calcium imaging analysis where we uh, identify the cells and we um, extract their traces. And also I developed um, an algorithm that then allows us to um, match these cells across days. And in this example data set that I'm showing here, we managed to identify 367 cells that are um, detected on six consecutive days. So here I'm only showing the um, first day of the recording and the last day, but we have these cells on each one of the days. And what we can do next is we can look at the activity of this population. So here it's the exact same 367 cells, but I'm plotting their activity on each one of the days. And I'm sure you can already see this um, um, interesting change in the synchronization that I talked about in the introductory slide. And um, we can also quantify this by some simple metrics <clears throat> such as, for example, the pairwise correlation, correlations between these uh, neurons in the population, and we see that this nice um, monotonic decrease. And another way to quantify this is um, using principal component analysis. And uh, here from this plot, we can just see that uh, with development, we need progressively more and more uh, principal components to explain a set amount of variance. So once we have these um, matched um, recordings, we can finally go on to um, test our big hypothesis about state modulation um, and to see if it really does arise at this um, period at the onset of sensation. And for this, we need a um, behavioral readout of state. And for now, we just use this um, very crude metric that has been used previously in the literature, uh, but it suffices for our purposes for now. And once we, once we perform this um, uh, detection of uh, motion, we get time series that look something like this. So on the top, you see um, this metric um, over time during a recording at the uh, postnatal day nine, so earlier in development, and below it's an example from later in development. And what this means is just that uh, when this trace is high, the animal would be performing more global movements that are detected by our camera. <clears throat> And once we have this, so this, I'll refer to this as motion, but we use this as a proxy of this sort of alert state um, in the animal. 
And uh, if our hypothesis is true, uh, it would mean that uh, there will be a relationship between this variable and the neural activity. And the way that we will test this is that we'll just fit a um, decoding model trying to predict this variable from the simultaneously recorded uh, neural activity. And the prediction would be that our, our model would uh, not perform particularly well at the early age, but then later on we would be able to predict this quite well. And if we plot the prediction of the model, this is exactly what we observe. So here I'm just plotting the prediction in pink overlaid by the um, ground truth. And <clears throat> since we have matched our neurons across days, we can also perform decoding from one age by fitting model to one age and predicting it on another age. And we can quantify the performance uh, using R squared. And we see something like this. So you see on the x-axis, it's the age at which the model was fit. And then on the y, it's the age at which it was tested. So you see that there is this sharp transition around P11 in this um, example case. And you can also see that um, we can perform cross-day um, analysis, meaning that this uh, representation is quite stable, So meaning that the same neurons that are encoding this state um, at one day uh, are also encoding it on the next once, once this state is developed. <clears throat> and another way that we can uh, visualize this is by just taking the most predictive neuron from the last day and overlaying it with the, this um, variable. And we see that here they overlap almost perfectly well. And then we can go progressively back in time. On the previous day, you see that these, these two time series correlate quite well still. But this gradually drops off the further back we go in development. <clears throat> and this explains this drop off of the performance across days. So the final question that we wanted to ask is, how does this uh, state encoding relate to global activity patterns? And uh, in order to quantify this, we just came up with these, these two axes in neural space. So one is the so-called motion, or let's say state axis, which is just the weights of each one of the neurons onto this, um, for, on this um, decoder. And the other one is just the first principal component, so the loadings of each neuron onto the uh, first principal component. And our hypothesis was that these two would become more and more similar, meaning that the neurons that uh, contribute to our decoding would be the same neurons that contribute a lot to the, uh, the major um, axis of variability. And when we quantify this, this is exactly what we observe. So here you see that there is this progressive increase in the alignment of these two axes, and there is especially this nice um, jump in the alignment once uh, this stable representation emerges. And a different way of uh, visualizing this is to just plot the um, time course of the first principal component and overlay it with motion. And uh, we see here a, with what would be expected from the plot on the right, that early on the first principal component in time doesn't correlate particularly well with this motion variable, whereas later on these two overlap uh, very well. So as a summary, uh, I, sh I present to you an experimental protocol uh, that allowed us to track the activity of hundreds of matched neurons throughout development. Uh, I showed a decrease in pairwise correlations and an increase in the dimensionality of the track population. Uh, I showed that state modulation emerges at the onset of sensation and remains stable across days. And that uh, once developed, this uh, state coupled activity corresponds to the main mode of neural variability. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, thank um, everyone from my lab, specifically Rosa and Jean-Claude for their supervision. I would like to um, thank our collaborators and uh, funding sources. And also I would like to um, advertise this uh, little package that we wrote for uh, tracking ourselves. Um, and also thank my uh, master student Manon who developed this nice GUI. So here I'm just showing one of these uh, running neurons that, that we identify. So thank you for your attention. Talk. We have time for um, a few questions. Yeah, back there, yeah. Hello. <coughs> Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering, you showed this sharp transition on P11, and whether it's known from like more micro scale uh, yeah, experiments, what happens in the mouse? Is this something where I don't know inhibitory neurons become more active or something like this? <coughs> 
Yes, yeah, so there, there are really a lot of uh, changes that are occurring in this, um, in this period. One of them is uh, this role of inhibitory neurons. For example, this, this has been um, shown to be related to this decorrelation of the, of the neural activity, but there's also other things coming in, so like axons from different areas and, and connections. Uh, recurrent corrections and so on. So it, I think it would be a bit difficult at this point to uh, speculate about the exact um, mechanisms. Yeah. Next question in the front. Great talk. Uh, what drives variability during early development? Ah, uh, so you mean what are the, what's causing the activation? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very good, uh, good question. So it's, it is a bit uh, area dependent. So for example, in the visual cortex, uh, there's a lot of uh, activity linked to these retinal waves. So these are uh, some sort of spontaneously generated uh, activities in the retina that then propagate through the visual hierarchy. And in the, um, in the um, barrel cortex, there is some um, evidence showing that they're related to some sort of um, very fast twitches and uh, of the whisker pad or of the whole body, uh, which are happening at a much faster scale. So this is something that our metric doesn't uh, capture, but it's something that we are planning to look at a bit further. But we, we see this as a separate thing from state. It's more uh, like spontaneous movements that are occurring in a faster scale. Yeah. Thank you. One more question in back, and if the next speaker could come, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. So you showed that uh, the neurons become the asynchronous progressively, but do they show any phase transition to that state? And if so, the, does this correspond to the, the, the period of the jump in prediction? Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear. So uh, sorry, the, 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 the neurons go uh, changes to asynchronous state. Mm -hmm. Do they show suddenly become asynchronous state? Uh, you're asking if it's a sudden transition or uh. if it's more a gradual thing? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I think it depends a bit, but th it's been shown in previous literature that this um, seems to be gradual, that it, uh, it doesn't end at where we finish the recording, mm. for example. So it would continue uh, towards adulthood and there would be more and more desynchronization. But this is the first time that we're doing these uh, recordings in the, same, um, in the same mouse and in the matched cells. So this might show us a bit more, um, might elucidate this a bit more. So the sudden change you saw in a prediction ability uh, is kind of different from yes, the activity yes, patterns. But it's, uh, it seems to be a bit variable uh, across mice, so it depends a bit on the weight. So mice that are heavier are usually in a further stage of development. So I wouldn't really say that P11 is uh, the age where this occurs. It's, it depends on uh, the individual, and uh, there are some litter effects and so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks again. <laughs>I want to start today by commending the organizers and the DEA, I, DEIA committee for deciding to put a talk about diversity into the main meeting, which um, is really important because this is where we can open up a dialogue with the skeptics instead of a self-selected group that already recognizes that diversity is important. Um, second, even though I've been really passionate about diversity, equity, and inclusion for my entire adult life. Um, I, just, I just like volunteering and serving underserved populations because it feels good to help people. I'm just one person and no single person can be diverse on their own. So I hope to convince you of some of my beliefs uh, and show you some evidence. And I hope that if you disagree that you will engage me in a dialogue here uh, in the Q&A section or later at the diversity luncheon. So I'm going to start today by telling you a little bit about my research program just so that you can orient. Um, and I'll just spend a few, a few minutes to do that and then I'll focus mostly about the issue at hand. Nearly all social species form hierarchies and find social isolation or exclusion aversive. 
And so this question of social homeostasis is an umbrella term for us to understand things like, how do we know our social rank? Or how does a social group maintain its structure even in the face of changing environmental conditions or internal membership? And um, how do we deal with challenges in our social environment? And so social homeostasis, this concept is really two things. It's uh, interested about the social homeostatic system within the individual brain. How does an individual regulate uh, their social needs? And also, how does the group function? And so um, I'm thinking about, in terms of the individual brain, the key essential ingredients of any homeostatic system. And so I'll just summarize um, my research program and say um, that Jillian Matthews, a former postdoc in my lab, along with Christopher Lee, who is here at this meeting, have worked to show that DRN, or dorsal rafe nucleus dopamine neurons, um, are an entry point for studying social homeostasis and also can serve as an effector system in that when you stimulate or inhibit these neurons, they can drive uh, social an increased or decreased motivation to seek social contact and that these neurons track uh, social isolation. And of course, in any social homeostatic or any homeostatic system, the effector system needs to receive input from a control center. And so um, we can trace backwards from DRN dopamine neurons. And my very first graduate student, Edward Nye, found that uh, lateral hypothalamic neurons, GABAergic ones, um, actually, when you stimulate them, you can get very unregulated social behaviors. And then uh, from the work of my former trainee, Stephen AZA Alsop, who um, actually did both his PhD and his postdoc in my lab, just staying one year because he's an MD PhD, he found that there's circuit loops that include the anterior cingulate cortex and the basal lateral amygdala that are important for detecting information. Specifically, we studied this in the context of observational learning, and we, we found that um, the anterior cingulate cortex is important for detecting the, the distress of another and then feeding this forward to the basal lateral amygdala where associative learning can be formed. And so that's um, just, you know, the beginning of what we think of the detector system, which is, of course, more complex than this. And then some of, of, a node that I think is unique to the social homeostatic circuit is the rank node. Some, some uh, node that can recognize your social rank and then modulate your control center set point or suppress your effector system so that you can behave appropriately for your social rank. And um, my former postdoc, who's now faculty, oh, and I should have said AZA is now faculty at Yale. Nancy Padilla Coriano is now faculty at University of Florida. And um, along with Kanha Batra, who's still a PhD student in my lab, almost graduated, looking for postdocs, very brilliant. Um, Nancy found that that um, PFC neurons in, uh, prefrontal cortical neurons in a reward competition task uh, can decode not only social rank, but also competitive success 30 seconds before the trial even begins. And Kanha um, then showed that if you model this using a hidden Markovian model combined with multiple generalized linear models inspired by work from um, Adam Calhoun, Jonathan Pillow, and Mala Murthy, that you can actually predict with great accuracy the specific behaviors um, in coming from PFC neural activity. Okay, so this is just a skeletal sketch of how things are, how, how we're thinking about this at the beginning of social homeostasis. I don't think this is the end all and be all. I think, um, I don't think it's a ball and stick chart either. I think it's all distributed coding. I just don't know how to draw that in a simple chart. So um, I'm not one of those people that thinks that uh, one brain region does one thing. No offense if you are. Um, and so we can take this now and think about how things change across time scales. So when we came into this field, it seemed really confusing. And we wondered why is it that after acute social isolation, organisms uh, display a pro-social response, a increase in affiliative behavior when reintroduced to their social group. But after chronic social isolation, when reintroduced to the social group, animals are displaying aggression, territorial behavior, avoidance, antisocial behavior. And so this was really a curious, you know, situation in the literature, how is it possible that you could do the same manipulation, social isolation, and the same stimulus, 
reintroduction to the social group, and get opposite valences across different time courses. And so um, we've theorized that uh, what happens is that when you're going through um, this experience and you're socially isolated, you'll detect this, your effector system will be activated, and so if you are a mouse, that might mean you're making ultrasonic vocalizations. If you're a human, maybe you're calling your friends, and then that can help you reconnect, and then homeostasis can be maintained, woohoo. Prosocial, however, with a chronic social isolation situation where maybe your whole colony got eaten by a predator or there's a global pandemic, um, sometimes social isolation happens, your effector system's activated, you call your friends and they say, sorry, we're quarantined, you're not in my bubble, and, uh, or, or you make vocalizations and, and there's no one there. At some point, there's a near step function like drop off of behaviors. Stop calling, stop leaving the borough, whatever it is. And so we speculate that with chronic isolation, at some point, the um, set point is adapted and basically your, your homeostatic set point for social contact comes down to your new normal. After which, when you are reintroduced to your social group, your previous optimum, it now feels like a surplus. So we want to take you know, this conceptual framework and work it out and discretize these variables. And so um, we want to be able to study exactly how this works, the quality and quantity of social contact, which is very squishy, but these are different, right? Qua quantity, there's such a thing as an optimum. There's too much, there's too little, and there's a just right. Whereas with quality, better's just better. And so these are separate projects. Um, and when we look at deficits in social, in social contact, quality or quantity, we can look at social isolation to look at deficits in quantity. Um, and we can look at social exclusion to look at deficits in quality. And so um, Chris Lee, who gave a poster yesterday, um, is working on the social isolation project, also about to graduate and extremely talented. If you have the opportunity to recruit him, you should absolutely do so. He's been an absolute godsend. And uh, Caroline Ja, who gave a short talk at COSIGN main meeting last year, um, also fantastic. And so putting this all together, um, this is essentially the big picture of my research program. So um, from my lab, I've had a, the privilege of running a really diverse research program. And you know everybody has their different strategies for running a lab. Some people want to hire a bunch of like-minded people to, for a common goal, and that's a perfectly, you know, it's a, a strategy that can work. I think things will can be calm and smooth. Um, I elected to purposefully um, recruit a very diverse group, people with very different backgrounds, um, computational people to biologists, behaviorists, psychologists, all sorts of different mindsets and and diverse perspectives, and um, I've been fortunate to have worked with uh, Anna Baylor, who is now faculty at Bordeaux, and has worked on, works now on the insular cortex in valence and homeostasis. She actually got tenure before I did. And um, Edward Nye, who is my very first graduate student, now a brand new assistant professor at UVA, takes computational modeling approaches to study reward and addiction. Stephen Azia Alsop, who's now at Yale, studying observational learning and how music can facilitate social interactions at a circuit level, super creative. Um, Gwendolyn Calhoun, who's a fantastic mentor and teacher, showed that BLA valence circuits are sensitive to hunger, now at Bates. Aim Sutton, who is now faculty at Temple, worked with Gwen doing longitudinal two-photon imaging in BLA neurons. Anthony Burgos Robles, who's now at UTSA, and um, has worked, has developed a lot of new behavioral par paradigms looking at prefrontal cortical and amygdala interactions. Cody Siciliano now runs a thriving lab at Vanderbilt studying the underpinnings of compulsive alcohol drinking. Nancy Padilla Coriano, who I mentioned before, uh, faculty at UVA, uh, sorry, University of Florida, excuse me, also started uh, the Stories of Win, Stories of Women in Neuroscience. Um, Al Kimchi, who is uh, MD, PhD, Hao Li, and Risha Patel are all now faculty at Northwestern. Fergal Mills is at Utah, just started his lab a, few, um, a couple months ago. Uh, and Austin Coley, who's still in my lab for a few more weeks, months, mm, we're, we're right, right there, who's going to be starting his lab at UCLA very soon, focusing on PFC uh, imaging and depression. 
And also, of course, this could be you if uh, you were, if you wanted to join the lab we are recruiting. But uh, enough about me. It's time to talk about you. And I need you to get ready to be brave. So I need you to raise your hand if you have ever felt that a project that you contributed to was in direct competition with another project. You can raise your hand if you felt pressured, if you've ever felt pressured to complete a project more quickly because there was direct competition. And then finally, if you have ever been scooped. Yeah. Sometimes you didn't know that was coming. Okay, so um, I wanna do a thought simulation. And by simulation, I mean a bunch of circles that I drew on Keynote. So let's take one case where we have a culture where we value diversity. And let's take another case where we value conformity. And let's just put, you know, matched resources, talent, et cetera, into this. And let's, let's assume that the goal of science is to understand everything that we don't know. All the unknown, chart, chart the darkness. And so let's see, let's run this simulation that I just drew. <laughs> it's not really math. Okay, so you can imagine <clears throat> the point here. Okay. So this simulation that I just made up, it's not really a simulation, but this thought simulation leads me to believe that the goal, if the goal of research and science is to understand the unknown, then diversity is the optimal strategy to span the parameter space, assuming we have fixed resources and time. Okay, next exercise. Get ready to be braver. Raise your hand if you have ever felt that you did not belong, or that you were singled out, or that you received attention that you did not want because of something that, about yourself that you can't control or can't change or don't want to change. Okay, thank you. Please raise your hand if you or someone you know experienced sexual harassment or sexual misconduct. Okay, thank you. And for those of you that did not raise your hand, next time that you're asked this question, you can raise it because you know me and I have experienced sexual harassment many times. Um, but the first time, the most egregious and traumatic time was when I was an undergraduate and I was se sexually harassed by my postdoc. Um, and it happened kind of slowly. It was gradually escalating. And it was, you know, I didn't really know. I was, I was 19 and um, it got to the point where I would ask my postdoc to please stop touching me, and he would get mad and send me home without pay. And so I wasn't able to make my rent. And so I reported him, I, I told him that I was gonna report him to the PI if it did not stop, and then he sent me home again. And so I reported it to the PI on Monday, and the PI told me, oh, that's so interesting, because the postdoc came to my house on Sunday to tell me that you're a compulsive liar, and so I don't really know what to do. He said, she said, you know. So basically what happened was that I was kicked out of the lab and I did not get a letter for graduate school, no letter of recommendation, no, you know, nothing on the paper, no evidence of any kind for the two years of work that I had put in. And I spent the senior year of, of, my, of my time at MIT folding towels at the athletic center. I was very close to leaving science and academia and then later, um, you know, pep talk from mom really helps. But, um, and, and of course, I, I was, I'm one of the very few privileged individuals that I have, my mother is a scientist. And so, you know, she, she gave me some tough love and um, that I'm really grateful for. Ended up continuing to go to grad school after taking a year off. Um, at some point, I mentioned, I, you know, I, I mentioned this to one of my mentors um, and I genuinely think he was, trying to help me, but you know, when you're raised in a, a toxic mentality and you're trying to help someone, it's like not helpful. And he told me, 
you know, basically that I should never tell anyone about this situation again because it made me sound crazy or like a troublemaker and no one would ever want to work with me. And so I never spoke about it again for 10 years until the Me Too movement. And then when that happened, it was like, I didn't feel alone. I felt, I felt like I'm not crazy. It's real. It's, I felt seen. And so um, that was really a powerful moment for me. But next time, everyone gets to raise their hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm not done, though. So um, there's, a lot, there's a lot more I have to say. Um, so academia, this is, this is towards my thesis that academia, as it currently, as, as experienced by some, is a toxic hierarchy where underrepresented members are punished most through systemic biases in publishing, hiring, funding, compensation, and even teaching evaluations. All of these have peer-reviewed publications that you can easily find with a two-minute Google search. Um, in terms of sexual harassment, the reported stats that we know, and we don't know how many individuals have experienced it, but don't report it, because I certainly never reported anything ever again after that first experience. 50% um, of female undergraduate students and over 58% of female faculty and staff members experienced sexual harassment on campus. This is not, you know, and there's lots of different problems. This is not just a gender issue, there's racial issues as well. Um, the Kafwe Jarasa, who for, we heard a lovely talk from yesterday, um, has also done some really important work on this and I'd point you to um, his, his, this paper and he's got another one coming out soon, but racism, sexism, all sorts of biases about, all sorts of features about ourselves that we can't control are there. And so one of the points that I wanna make is that um, even though we can't always see these important factors about, you know, and when we think about exploring the parameter space in science, we want intellectual diversity and conceptual diversity, but we can't really measure that. Like, it's really difficult to measure. It's hard to know. Do I have the maximal amount of conceptual and intellectual diversity in my group, in the field, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of like an unknowable question because we don't even know the parameter space of what is unknown. That's by definition unknown. Um, so I think when we see proxies or, or symptoms or signs, I don't know what the right word is, but when there are these observable features like race and gender, um, for example, that are very you know, readily observable, if we see a lack of diversity, this is a symptom that maybe there's a culture of conformity and maybe there are many other dimensions that cluster with those observable features that are not observable. Many latent factors that we can't easily detect that cluster with these observable features and suggest that there may be a lack of conceptual and intellectual diversity. So um, gender disparity is still an unsolved issue in the US, in the UK, in Europe. Um, and it starts out with, you know, women are at a slight majority. And then as you go through the ranks and rise to positions of power, become minoritized. And um, we all know we can interpret this however we want, but gender disparities are still systemic through this field. I do want to again, emphasize that I think COSIGN as a meeting has been excellent in its leadership for promoting gender parity um, and, and, and putting this talk in the main meeting. So um, I think this is not a meeting problem as much as a systemic field problem. Okay, so now to more general things that affect maybe everyone. Um, raise your hand if you've ever felt less important than other people you work with. Raise your hand if you've ever felt invisible or powerless or devalued. Okay, um, I'm sorry that you guys had that experience and I, I hope that you, thank you for staying. Thank you for staying here. Um, but toxic hierarchies 
eventually collapse. They poison themselves. And by treating our trainees or each other in ways that make our, each other feel devalued or not respected or not important, we are, we are crumbling our foundation at our feet. We are, um, we are creating a toxic environment where there's a mass exodus of academics leaving academia, going to industry. And you can see this, the pre-doc funding, this is, a, sorry, this graph is from the NIH at, in, in the US, and in the pre-doc funding, there's still lots of people who are getting PhDs, but uh, in terms of postdocs, it's, it's, it's plummeting. Um, there are fewer and fewer postdocs that want to stay in academia. And so it's not very surprising um, to think about why this is happening. Um, we, the, the way that we, the culture of academia promotes a treatment of trainees that is frankly unethical. And um, I think that I, I, I want to, I have to say that I, I've many times felt powerless. Most of my career I felt powerless. Most of my career I felt imposter syndrome. And um, I actually feel like most of the lessons I've learned have been from my trainees, actually. And one of them is Raimondo Miranda. And he started in my lab um, through a diversity program at MIT and then moved with me to the Salk as a technician. And then when he, when he became a, a graduate student after working in my lab as a technician, he realized, oh my gosh, the treatment of graduate students, this is way more work and way less compensation. And um, began holding town halls, took the initiative to to note this is a problem. I mean, of course, I was a graduate student, and yeah, it was, it was tough, it was just, you know, it was difficult, but I just, I, I, the idea that, that, you know, I could do something to change it was so far beyond. I was just trying to hide and assimilate and like not get, I don't know, singled out. And um, so I really admire his, his bravery for taking this leadership. But after starting these town halls, he became the elected strike rep leader for the UC union of 45,000 people. And um, we went on strike. This is a picture of my, my lab meeting that we just took to the picket line so that we weren't scabbers. And um, it was a really transformative and ex inspiring experience to be on the picket line with trainees fighting for what they deserve, fighting to be able to make this a sustainable ecosystem. So I applaud everyone who's ever unionized and who's ever been part of a picket line, who's ever supported people who are unionizing to, to do this and to realize that they have the power, that you all have the power to evolve this toxic hierarchy into a sustainable ecosystem. And so, you know, baby steps, we're, we're not there yet. We'll get there, hopefully, one step at a time. Um, but I, I thought this little infograph was helpful. Um, and so, okay, what, what are, if you are in a position of power, what are things that you can do to make things better? Um, mainly, it would be distribute the power. What can you do to make your environment more egalitarian? Um, what can you do to solicit feedback, anonymously or non-anonymously? Um, but I think as I've gotten, you know, as I've um, become, I guess, more senior, people tell me bad news less. People still say the good things, all the compliments. I feel like I still get the really nice thank you notes and the compliments, and what I don't get is the potentially offensive critical feedback. And so uh, how do we get this? And I'd say um, I've really benefited from the anonymous lab survey. Originally from Vanessa Ruda, adapted and, and promoted, uh, I learned about it from Leslie Vosshall. And so this is something that we've done in my lab and um, it's really powerful. This is a little bird cloud that came from my, my most recent um, anonymous lab survey. And I'll say that when we do this, it's, I get hundreds and hundreds of, of pages of text back. Some of it's good, I already knew that stuff. The stuff I really needed the survey for was the things that people were afraid to say to me because, you know, there's a power system and, and I, I, I totally understand. I mean, I thought I'm super cool and approachable. You could tell me anything, right? Wrong. No, no one's cool enough. Everybody's, you know, like if you're in a position of power, not everybody's gonna tell you what they really think, okay? Some brave people will and you, I respect, but not everybody will. And the people who are struggling the most are probably the least likely to come to you. So have, I really, I re recommend the anonymous lab survey. When I read my feedback, 
almost every time I cry, it's like, it's hard to, it's hard to realize that, oh my God, I interrupted someone again and then, oh my God, you know, I, I was late and then you know, all these different things that you don't realize that you're doing that are harmful. And sometimes it's really useful and important to get that feedback. So if you are in a position of power and you think you're perfect, I recommend that you, you send your lab an anonymous lab survey. Okay, so um, I'll just say the pen pendulum swings and we can push it. Um, in 2016, I would have said that it swung like really far to the right. But um, actually, I feel like Trump's misogyny and the exposure of Harvey Weinstein's sexual abuse and misconduct galvanized the Me Too movement. Beth Ann McLaughlin was denied tenure in 2017 and sparked the hashtag Me Too STEM um, movement. And this was, this was um, a big time. 2018 and 2019, I would have said widespread recognition that diversity, particularly gender parity, is important. Um, Bias Watch Neuro established a practice of counting the number of female presenters at conferences to hold conference organizers accountable for their, their biases. And um, it was almost, you know, in, in, in my sphere at least, an echo chamber. Everybody agreed that diversity was important, mostly, at least out loud. And then uh, 2020, global pandemic, George Floyd's murder um, sparks protests and catalyzes the BLM movement. Uh, Beth Ann McLaughlin is revealed a fraud. Um, and then, in, oops, sorry, in 20, 2021 to 2023, this was actually a, a, a time where there was a lot of recognition for the importance of, of anti-racism, of DEI programs. Um, DEI statements were required at a lot of, for a lot of applications, hiring processes. Um, but then the problem with this was tokenism. There's also a lot of other hardships in the world, war in Ukraine, the Israel-Palestine conflict. There have been a lot of different challenges that affect subpopulations and really everyone. So, and then after that, now we're coming to a different time where Texas and Florida, some states in the US have now prohibited DEI programs. And um, you know, the, there's a lot of movement here. So to, to close, um, I just wanna say that intellectual and conceptual diversity is necessary to maximize scientific progress, given a fixed amount of resources and time. If there's a lack of diversity in observable features, it's likely that there are other non-observable features that cluster with this. And academic power structures as they currently stand are toxic as evidenced by the outcomes. And that even if you are, even if you feel powerless, you are not. And given, um, you know, now that I'm senior and I'm a full professor, I can tell you that your best is good enough. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Well, thank you for the fantastic talk. Um, we have time for a, a few questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Tai, for uh, being so neuro-inspired. Um, because at this point, we know that, for example, in the brain, heterogeneity, variability, um, you know, like a larger variance, um, actually is good for coding, it's good for memory, it's good for how the brain functions. And of course, that you're able to, um, you know, just the way you promote your colleagues, uh, your, your trainees, and that they've, you know, uh, my previous postdoc supervisor, like none of us have become professors. You know, and so I, I just, uh, if we can come up with a metric or a way to push that, that's wonderful. And um, just to be able to talk about these questions, I mean, I, I respect so much what you've been able to do. Um, and I thought I could as well, but after, you know, raising your hand enough times, um, it's just too exhausting. And so I've taken a different path. Um, and I hope you can come on um, March 5th um, to talk about um, the ways I think maybe I can help to solve these things. And I wonder if you could answer, um, beyond uh, being open to feedback, mm -hmm. um, what else can people do um, on the different levels? Like, I, I, it feels like the abused child abuses their child, you know? And, and we know this is true. Um, and I think this is maybe the cycle that we have in academia, where each generation is abused. And so, you know, is there some way to just, like, open the consciousness where people become self-aware enough to 
you know, to break that cycle? That's a really great question. Um, and, you know, I think I, I, was, I was one of those people. Um, I, I think I came from sort of a toxic hierarchy, and my experiences early were very much, um, you know, embedded in, in where, where power was abused. And I had to unlearn a lot of things. I needed um, people I respected to say, hey Kay, what's up, with your, what's up with your gender bias? Why did you organize this meeting with only 24% female speakers? Or, and then it made me have this existential crisis of, oh my gosh, I have biases against myself. It makes me doubt myself. And you know, I think um, it's the little tiny movements. It's, it's the conversations, honestly, that are, one-on-one -on -one that um, really stay with me because we're making a connection and someone's not confronting me in public and I'm just being, you know, it's not pitchforks, it's, it's uh, someone just trying to, un you know, we're just trying to understand each, other, each other's perspectives. And so for me, um, my deconditioning was through inspiring colleagues that I've had the privilege to know. So thank you so much for your comments, I appreciate that. So I apologize, we're running a little over. Um, we can continue the discussion at the DIA luncheon for those of you who are coming. So thank you again, Kate, for a fantastic talk. Thank you. So before everyone leaves, um, so uh, next is uh, Chand and Bing are gonna come, um, uh, come and uh, make some closing remarks. But uh, as Chand's getting set up, I wanna uh, make an announcement. So the, for those of you who are signed up for the D, uh, DEIA luncheon, um, it does not say in the program where it's actually located, so it tells you, it's, so it's in the, the uh, Villa Gale uh, Opera Hotel. So it's in the room, it's called the Sao Carlos room. So when you just walk in through the front door, you turn left and it's just a door to the left of the front desk of the hotel and then it's right there. If you, if you can't find it, send a Whova, the, the app message to Francisco Aparicio. It's the first Francisco that pops up. Okay, and that'll be starting soon. All right, thanks. All right, everyone, we're very close to the end of the main program. Um, so Chanda, I wanted to take this opportunity to once again thank you all for being here, for being, I mean, you, you, are, you are cosine, right? Cosine is not the, it's not the, the empty hallways and the, and the empty lecture halls. It's all of you in it. So thank you all for being here, for sharing with us your science, your time, and yourselves. Um, we especially wanted to acknowledge again that the, the, the attendee numbers have been changing throughout the main meeting. I think a couple of people decided during the meeting that they're actually going to go to the workshop, so we now officially have more than a thousand attendees at the workshops as well. Um, approximately 10 undergraduates received travel awards to come to COSIGN this year, so we're really delighted to, wel to welcome a lot of new faces and the next generation of scientists to our community. So I don't know about you, but one of the things that I learned from this meeting is uh, what I'm gonna be focused my, my research program on for the next year, um, which is a really important question. Is a bumblebee a transformer? <laughs> we all have a whole year to work on this. I hoped that we have, we'll have made a lot of progress by next year. Thank you, Bing, and thank you, Kay, for this wonderful, for the wonderful talk, and thank you all for being part of this meeting. I just have a few announcements for, uh, for us. It's like, um, one of the questions, one of the big changes we made this year, based on like, uh, advice from Zach Maynard and the EC, was to change the posters to the lunchtime. And obviously, some of you might have strong opinions in one way, others might have strong opinions the other way. Please tell us. So the question is, are lunchtime posters a good idea? Go to Yehovah app, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and um, you can go find the surveys, which is in the main homepage of the app. There's a little button called surveys. Click that, and then please answer these questions for us. This will help us plan future meetings and how to organize it. And remember, you all make cosign. Like, I mean, the EC and all the, P the program chairs and everyone, we only act on what you want to do, and then we try to use our own judgment. So please help us out, okay? A couple of other announcements. So um, buses to Kashkesh will be leaving at 3 p.m. from the conference center. Um, Cosign 2025 will be in Montreal. Uh, it'll be from the 27th of March to April 1st, 2025. And we're actually going to move the abstract submission deadline. I'm, I'm sure multiple of you are groaning. You're like, Chandi, you're the worst. Why are you doing this? Blah, blah, blah. I'll take it. I don't care. Um, so. <laughs> 
Uh, it'll be sometime late October. That's because it'll give more time for people to submit their abstracts, for us to review the abstracts, and most importantly, I'm sure you've all had colleagues who are immigrants who are unfortunately unable to attend the meeting because of visa issues, right? That's another aspect. And um, so hopefully we'll get everyone more time to get visas and be part of this amazing meeting. Now I'm going to let... Thank you. Uh, and thanks to, the, thanks to the EC also for being flexible with these things. Stephanie's going to come do her mic drop moment, so I will let her be. Thank you. All right. M much like the Thalmus, Organizing COSIGN requires a lot of integration and distri distribution. I want to tell you that our organizing committee, the heart and soul of that, are Bing and Chand, and I want you all to just thank them one more time for organizing such a great meeting. Okay, keep talking, keep thinking, and travel safe, everyone. Thank you.